Good morning and welcome to Ilham. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to Trade, Ties and Transformations, Stories of Textile and Modernity. Today's symposium is held in conjunction with our exhibition, Love Me in My Batik, Modern Batik Art from Malaysia and Beyond, and is part of Ilham's ongoing public and education programs. Um, okay, morning. So for those of you who are familiar with the gallery's public program, you will know that the programs here tend to broaden the scope of the exhibition by looking at subjects or topics that are related to the exhibition, sometimes more directly than others. Uh, we know from very early on that we were putting, as we were putting together this exhibition that we wanted to organize a symposium, but we didn't want it to be exclusively about batik painting. So I guess one of the underlying themes, of, uh, cent themes central to the exhibition, which uh, we were hoping to expand upon, is this idea of modernity as a period of technological, cultural, political, and economic change and how this impacted on the development of textile traditions of Southeast Asia. We wanted a symposium that would bring together researchers who are working on different areas and with different textile forms so that we might get a broad comparative sense of this phenomenon over the course of the 20th century. And I think more importantly is that we didn't want to perpetuate the common belief that the textile traditions belonging to a particular culture only exist as part of an unchanging traditional form, and that this form is inherently fixed. As an object or work of art, it is also part of history. And what is history really but change? So this is not one of those heritage conferences where we sort of pine romantically or nostalgically for a lost, unchanging past, and then reclaim this past for the nation. We're going to try to deconstruct some of these cherished patriotic myths and think about movements of cultural forms, and in doing so, chart the changes in values and meanings behind the, those forms. I think the crucial keyword that underlines all our presentations here today is this notion of transformation, be they social, cultural, political, or economic. What happens when artistic forms, patterns of circulation, and meanings are altered? What happens when they are altered? Under what circumstances? is a textile tradition fashioned into national cultural propaganda. In what instances does a textile form move beyond the borders of the nation and inspire artistic cultures elsewhere? How do textile makers find a balance between our present day way of thinking and the continuance of a traditional knowledge system from which the textile originally emerged? These are some of the questions we hope our panel of esteemed speakers will be able to answer through their riveting and absorb absorbing research. We are extremely fortunate to have with us four eminent scholars from India, Australia, Thailand and Malaysia who are here with us today. We begin with a presentation on Tagore and Batik by Shupriya Roy from Shantiniketan, followed by Maria Ronska Friend from Queensland, Australia, who will speak on Javanese batik and its influence on artists in Europe and Africa. After lunch, we will hear from Exuda Singalampong, who will speak on Queen Sirikit's contribution to national identity in Thailand through the championing of Thai textiles and the creation of the national dress. And finally, Waylin Jeffrey Jehom from University of Malaya, will speak about an exhibition she organized on the Poa Kumbu of Sarawak. And uh, we will end the symposium uh, with a panel discussion uh, with all the speakers. Uh, before we begin, uh, just some housekeeping rules. Uh, we would be grateful if you could please turn off uh, all your handphones or put it on silent. And also if you could, uh, and also no recording uh, devices during the presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Now to begin our morning session, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you uh, to, our first, uh, uh, to our first talk. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Rabindranath Tagore was one of modern India's greatest writers and poets and won the Nash uh, Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913. So what was his connection with Bate? 
Our next speaker is eminently qualified to speak on this. She is a Tagore scholar from Shantaniketan and has worked in Rabindra Bhavan, the Tagore Research Center of Vishwa Bharati, as a librarian and archivist for three decades. She has been series editor for the Tagore Travel Logs and has edited and contributed to many publications on Tagore. She has also curated exhibitions which have traveled all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Shupriya Roy. Good morning, everyone. Don't need to start. Is this all right? <laughs> okay. Good morning once again. Uh, from Java to Shantiniketan, the story of Batik. Preparing an atmosphere. When we tell the story of Batik in Shantiniketan, we recognize that a number of factors converge to make this a success story. We also need to discern what Rabindranath wanted for Shantiniketan and how he went about creating first Shantiniketan and later his university, Vishwabharati. The absorbing of Batik into the Shantiniketan aesthetics was not an isolated event. It was part of a plan by Rabindranath to create a university where the world made its home in a single nest. In 1901, when Rabindranath opened his school for children in Shantiniketan, he was aware of the necessity of having an appropriate atmosphere. He said, knowing something of the natural school which nature herself supplies to all her creatures, I chose a delightful spot and used to hold my classes under some big shady tree. I trusted to the presence of the spirit of freedom in the atmosphere. We have here the open beauty of the sky and the different seasons revolve before our eyes in all the magnificence of their color. In 1916, after a visit to Japan, he realized the need for an artistic atmosphere for this place. When he set out to create this atmosphere, he chose as his collaborator the artist Nandolal Bosch. Helping them in this endeavor was Shurendranath Kaur and his son Rothindranath Tagore. Nandolal's responsibility did not stop with running an art school on modern lines. He had also to rally the whole community in an aesthetic quest. Nandolal took it up as a challenge. It seemed possible that with the right effort, all members of a community, whether housewives, working men, or school children, can be creative of sorts within their talent and potential. So he gave attention to all, inducing them to learn alpona, which is a kind of floor decoration, batik, leather craft, picture making with simple units, Besides, he, he tried to bring cleanliness and order into the campus, considered elegance in its buildings and interiors, visual variety and liveliness to its festivals and dramas, a distinctive graphic image to its publications, even set standards of refinement in personal and group conduct, so that at one time he managed to bring to the place a special aesthetic aura, the hallmark of which was a dynamic simplicity. Shantiniketan influenced the rest of India in this field of aesthetics. And when students of Kala Bhavan took up teaching assignments in the art schools of India, 
they carried with them this refined taste which included batik, which, was, which they taught and included in the syllabus. Rabindranath had a wider vision for Kala Bhavan, the art college from the beginning. He realized the need for the students and the community to have an exposure to the arts and crafts from different regions of India and from all over the world. A conscious effort was made to procure specimens for the Kala Bhavan Museum, which is why on most of his foreign trips, he was accompanied by an artist from Shantiniketan, who not only collected works of art for Kala Bhavan, but also learned different techniques for incorporation into the syllabus. Pratima Devi learned fresco making in Paris and taught these methods to the students. Nandulal traveled to China and Japan and taught his students techniques of the art in those countries. Shurendranath traveled to the Java Islands from where he learned batik, which he introduced into Shantiniketan. He also learned lithography in London, which he introduced later into Kalabhavan. The poet's visit to Java. <clears throat> Robindranath was toying with the idea of visiting Java and Bali for some time. As early as 1915, in a letter to C.F. Andrews, he wrote, My own mind, as usual, is a thirst, longing to touch the skirt of the dim distance, dreaming of faraway islands redolent of perfume indefinable. I have had a pamphlet sent me by a distinguished American artist who spent three years of his life in Bali, an island near Java. Some remnant of old India remains stranded in that lonely place for centuries. Its voice comes to me across the sea, mingled with the murmur of lovely palm groves. Why not pay a visit to that prisoner of time and see if it has a language that I dimly understand? During his European tour of 1926, he had received invitations from several prominent people, both Dutch and Javanese, to undertake the tour. He received formal invitations from most of the towns of British Malaya and also from the Kunskring and the Java Institute, two important art and literary societies of Java. When he found financial patronage from a couple of industrialists, this trip was made possible. He had chosen as his companions Shuniti Kumar Chatterjee, linguist and polyglot, the artist Shurendranath Kaur and Dhirendra Krishna Dev Burman. Arnold Bake and his wife would be present in Indonesia. Robindranath was an avid traveler, but not in the manner of the modern tourist. When he visited a new country, he was not so interested in their scenic spots or historical sites in a superficial manner. In fact, his travel writings do not mention the flora or fauna of the new country or even other details we look for in travel books. He looked at each country as part of the larger worldview. On one level, he analyzed the history and culture of the place from the perspective of his own country. And on the other, he tried to place all this in a framework cutting across time and physical boundaries. While Rabindranath was most fascinated, what Rabindranath was most fascinated with in Java were their dance, their rendering of the epics Ramayana and Mahabharata in dance dramas, and their batik. In his letters home, he wrote about these in detail. He admired these artistic forms, and when he returned to Shantiniketan, he borrowed heavily from them. However, he was aware that these forms were intrinsically Javan and were stylized. These art forms entailed a formal code of aesthetics and the discipline and training that went with it. There was not much scope for individual creativity. The artists and dancers were following a tradition that had evolved through the years. 
When these art forms were adapted in Shantiniketan, the free spirit of Rabindranath students changed these forms to suit their inclinations. The idea of dance drama of Java gave way to a new genre in Rabindranath's oeuvre. Like the Javanese, he took his narratives from the epics and also from Buddhist lore. But the presentation was modern, catering to contemporary tastes. The dance steps often followed no tradition, but were choreographed innovatively by the dance teachers of Shantaniketan. Each performance was often differently interpreted by the choreographer or even the dancers themselves. There was no conformity to a given set of instructions. Writing about the dance, dances in Java, he states, there was no limit to the skill and elegance of the players, whose every gesture and movement had their special significance in a technique that had attained perfection after long culture and severe training, and so cannot be lightly dismissed. We must therefore come back to the conclusion that by far, the most important thing for them are the pictorial gestures, the rhythmic movements that speak to them with a wealth of expressiveness which they do not have for us. Batik in Java. From reports by the poet's companions, we come to know that the women of the royal house of Manko Nikoro the sixth could be seen all over the place. They were beautiful, with trim, well-shaped bodies, mostly busy with artistic work. In a number of places, the work of preparing bati could be seen. The group from India was impressed with this technique of dyeing cloth. Although the process is time-consuming, they said, the result is beautiful. It had a delicate softness to it, something that could not have been machine-made. They felt it was fortunate that the technique had been kept alive. Aristocratic families of Java wore batik, and the women of such households kept up the tradition of making it. Each household has its own designs, which outsiders cannot wear. Although there is no legal ban on wearing these designs, people follow this tradition faithfully. Connoisseurs of textiles from Europe held this art form in high esteem. And now I, I, I'm, going to give, I'm going to read uh, some extracts from Rabindranath's letters uh, on Batik. From the house of Mankunegoro the sixth in Surabaya, Rabindranath writes, Our days passed mostly within the palace of our host, the courtyard was planted with trees, and there was also a vine-shaded arbor. Our hostess spent much of her time under the shade of this bower. The women of the household sat here and there doing their batik work, for which this island is famous. Describing the costume of the dancers at Surakarta, the poet observes, The shoulders and arms were bare. A tight-fitting corset of green and gold extended from breast to waist, and the two closely pleated ends of their waistband hung loose in front. The nether cloth, worn like a sari, was finely decorated with batik work. This seemed just like the figures in the Ajanta pictures. The next morning, after a tour of the palace, they were met by Manko Nigoro, the seventh, and his wife. Rabindranath writes, On a table, there were cloths ornamented with batik work. I was asked to select three of these, and the rest of the party won each, as mementos. It takes two or three months to make these decorations, the maids of the household being adept in the art. Shurendranath recalls the same uh, event in a letter that he wrote home. After being served snacks from golden plates by variously liveried servants, we were taken to a table where batik cloths were stacked. 
we were asked to choose from these. The queen selected three pieces for Gurudev. Cloth for the royal household is prepared here. In one place, we saw rows of girls sitting and making these batik cloths. One evening, Robindranath and his com companions were invited to the palace of Sosohonan, where his son, Kusumayodo, was their host. They were shown a shadow puppet show, Vayang called it. And then Rubinath writes, When we were coming away, our host gave me a present of great rarity, a piece of batik work cloth made only for members of the Raja's own family. I could not have purchased such another in the market. The collection of batik that we have in the Kalabhavan Museum, however, are not all gifts from royal families. When the poet's companions shopped for artifacts to take back to Shantiniketun, they also purchased batik cloths from the market. During his stay in Java, many of the textile traders from India came to visit him and invited him to their homes. On 10th September, Robindranath was invited to a Sindhi shop belonging to V. Lokumal at Kambong Dupen for tea. He was presented with a purse containing 125 guilders for Vishwabharati and some rare crafts from Java and some batik pieces. On 14 September after breakfast, Robindranath's companions wandered through the markets adjoining the house of Manko Negoro. They were to acquire, among other artifacts, metal chaps of various beautiful designs to be used in batik. In Surakarta, Shurendranath Kaur bought some batik pieces from a shop whose owner was Harjyo Pradyojo. On 17 September, the group from India purchased more textiles from some Chinese shops which they felt were better stocked. They were able to acquire batik pieces and patola kamarbans with designs of tigers, elephants and swans. On the 18th morning, after Robindranath opened a newly built road to the public, which was named Tegostrat, they proceeded to Jogjakarta. In Jogjakarta, they stayed for a week at the house of the Raja Pako Alam. Although the host could not speak English, the poet liked him and chatted with the help of Arnold Bake. The host had a large collection of pictures of batik designs, which he showed his guests. The group from India bought some curios and possibly textiles from a workshop belonging to Terhurst. They also visited the home of the Dressings, who had a fabulous collection of textiles, especially brocades made in Sumatra, which were of equally good or even better than the ones from Surat or Kashmir. They, they also had a large collection of patola silks. Robindranath spent over six weeks in Java and Bali, his wanderlust appeased. Talking about his travels, Robindranath very often used the metaphor of a bird. From time to time, something calls me from beyond the ocean and my wings flutter. If the world was his sky, he created his nest in Vishwabharata. Its motto being, Yatra Vishwam Bhavata Yekaniram, where the world makes its home in a single nest. And like a bird, he gathered whatever he found in the lands he traveled and brought these back to Vishwabharati. Rabindranath had always borrowed freely from whatever good he found anywhere. He often said that it was our right to take the best from any country and also to offer the best we have. He was able to absorb and assimilate what he borrowed and make it his own. Creations from these borrowings had the clear stamp of Rabindranath or Shantiniketan on them. Batik in Shantiniketan. Shurendranath Kaur was an asset on this tour. Quiet and self-effacing, he was a keen observer. Shurendranath was aware of his responsibility in this group 
and was constantly picking up artifacts which would expose the art students of his institution to the crafts of these faraway places. He also made sketches of various design elements and motifs which he would introduce into Shantiniketon architecture and craft on his return. While in Java, Shurendranath learned the process of batik printing, which he in turn taught the teachers and students of Shantiniketon. It was through Shantiniketon that batik printing entered India. In an interview, Shurendranath had said, and I'm quoting Shurendranath, on this trip, I had the opportunity to learn a lot of things. Firstly, I found the Java craft of batik very attractive. I realized the effectiveness in its use in clothes for men and women, in interior decoration, in stage decor, and therefore, during the tour, I tried to master this craft. On my return, I was able to introduce this craft in Kalabhavan. In Shantiniketon life, the use of batik in festivals, in costumes for dramatic performances, in stage decor, and in interior decor, found a place of honor. Slowly from Shantiniketon, this beautiful craft spread to all parts of Bengal and to many places in India, mainly through the efforts of students and staff of Shantiniketon. The clothes of Java and Sumatra attracted me very much. I made a lot of sketches. I also made sketches of furniture, lamps, and vessels of various shapes. Whenever I saw a design I liked, in textiles or in any object, I would capture its memory in my sketchbook. Later, whenever I had occasion to use these designs or motifs in the Uttarayan interiors, in Gurudev's plays, in stage decor, in the costumes of the actors and actresses, I felt satisfied. In Rabindranath's attempt at bringing into being a new aesthetics in Shantiniketun, these plays, their performances, the decorations used at festivals, the use of costumes fitted in nicely and added a new dimension. When the technique of batik was introduced into Shantiniketun, Rabindranath's daughter-in-law, Prothima Devi, Nandolal's daughters, Gauri and Jomuna, took great interest. However, they did not follow the Javanese designs or their colors. The technique was adapted to Shantiniketun designs. The designs were from nature, flowers like the lotus or the polash or hibiscus. Imaginary flowers were also created in these designs. The motifs of peacock or fish were recurrent. The colors most popular were white, yellow ochre, red, and dark brown. We also come across shades of blue and mauve. Designs were also adapted from the wall paintings of Ajanta. We need to mention here that although the technique of batik was brought from Java, certain adjustments were made to suit the style and abilities of the craftspeople here. Instead of using the chanting to apply molten wax, a paintbrush is used. The, this gave batik a new dimension. It became another form of art. The artists were given full freedom to create their own designs, unlike the restrictions in Javanese batik. The artists had already acquired a skill in creating designs for alpona and embroidery. These skills were now used to create batik. In Java batik, colors seeping through, the, through cracks in the wax were considered of low quality. Strangely, these cracks were appreciated by the batik aficionados here. Efforts were made to, take, to create strong, colorful cracks. Yardage is often prepared with different colored cracks and no other design. A kind of Shantiniketon design had developed at the initiative of Nandolal Bosch. He reasserted <clears throat> the importance of form in art. He was an artist adept at many crafts, who explored techniques and styles with the aim of mastering the media of expression. 
His creative works, therefore, span an enormous range from murals to embroidery and batik, from stage decor to jewelry made of fresh flowers and leaves. Nandolal had an innate feeling for design. He taught design and insisted that design become a part of everyday life. His design, though based on natural forms, was not naturalistic. Nandolal helping students to create their own designs wrote, the designs to be used on cloth should be decorative. The success of the designs is not in copying exactly from nature, flowers, creepers, and leaves, but in the creation of designs based on these, in the artist's own rhythm and in his choice of color and form. His daughter Jomuna writes, only getting hold of a design is not enough. Not everyone can use colors harmoniously, yet this can be done quite easily if we take the help of nature. We see beautiful combinations of color in nature trees, leaves, flowers, birds, butterflies. In all these, we find a harmonious blend of colors. If we collect color combinations from these, what could be more beautiful and accurate? One has to be alert to these colors and keep one's eyes open. One should be careful while taking colors from nature. Not only should the combinations be correct, but also the amount of each color should be similar. Batik gradually became very popular, with Batik being introduced into the syllabus of all art courses offered in Kalapavan. Among the earliest artists who mastered the craft of Batik was Gauri Bhanjod, the daughter of Nandulal Bush. She was skilled in alpona, embroidery, leather craft, and macram. She was also one of the earliest teachers of Batik. Her siblings, Jomuna Shen and Vishwarup Bosch, all children of Nandulal Bosch, were also regular artists. A, member of a number of Kalabhavan students took keen interest in this new craft, and gradually it became popular in Shantiniketun. Kalabhavan students, when they went outside Shantiniketun with teaching assignments, taught their students, and the technique spread across India. However, Shantiniketun is still the center for batik in India. It, has, it had grown into a cottage industry, producing all kinds of batik, ranging from the average quality to exclusive and exquisitely beautiful batik crafted by some individuals. Others who excelled in batik during its early years, Anoni Gopal Ghosh, Shishir Ghosh, Abdul Majid, and Bihari Barbhaya. They taught batik, and some of them left. Some of them who left Shantiniketun carried the art with them to their new places of teaching. Beginning with Shantiniketun, within a few years, batik was being taught in most centers of arts and crafts in India. In Bishobharati, a separate unit for rural crafts, Shilposhadun, came into existence as part of Rabindranath's vision for rural reconstruction. The development of cottage industries had always been one of the chief aims of the comprehensive scheme of education envisaged by the poet. He had three objectives. One was to revive the many dying crafts which were once the pride of villages. The second was, by doing so, to ensure the well-being and happiness of the masses. The third was to open diverse channels for self-expression before the village folk. He said, in our, re in our organization, we have not ignored the problem of livelihood, but also recognized the great value of aesthetic joy. This department introduced weaving, calico printing, dari making, batik, leather craft, lacquer work, paper making, and woodwork units. These units produced utility articles of high quality and elegant taste and found a market all over India. At Shilpashadun in Sriniketun, Batik was taught to villagers to help them eke out extra income from this cottage industry. 
designs, dyes, and cloth were supplied by Shilpa Shodhan, and the finished products were marketed by the center. The practice of this craft kept increasing till batik became a thriving cottage industry. In 1928, on a trip to Europe, Rothindranath and his wife Pratima Devi realized the potential of leather craft on seeing beautiful leather products which were very popular in European markets. Keeping these ideas in mind, Rothindranath came back with tools for leather craft. With the help of a few students from the school, he began an experiment in producing various articles of utility but adapting rural designs from Birbhum. Within a couple of years, this craft became very popular and started attracting several art students from Kalabhavan. Batik was used on leather work very successfully, and this gave the and this gave where is it? Um, the leather products of this place a distinctive identity. The leather batik products include handbags, purses boxes of various shapes and sizes, folders, bean bag seats, etc. Apart from Kala Bhavan and Shilpa Shodhan, both part of Bishwabharati, there were some other agencies that helped to sponsor Batik artisans. In the year 1926, Shushen Mukhopadhyay called upon the craftsmen of this region to come under the umbrella of a society which we know today as the Amar Kutir Society for Rural Development. This society is today one of the oldest and largest in India, which caters to a whole gamut of traditional handicrafts, including leather goods, hand embroidered items, batik, terracotta, jute, bamboo, and other regional crafts. Batik is being made by the inhabitants of nearby villages and is marketed in a showroom that is open throughout the year. These are some of the products that are available now. Karu Shongho. Sometime in 1929, Nondulal Bosch felt the need to create a platform for his art students whereby they could pursue their art on their own and also earn a livelihood. He planned an artist's guild and named it Karu Shongho. Advertisements that appeared in contemporary periodicals offered paintings, illustration and cover design for books, posters, designs for jewelry, furniture, etc., batik, embroidery, and leather craft. It functioned from a quaint tree house called Taludhaj. This is Taludhaj. A mud house built at, around a tall palm tree. The mainstay of this shongho was batik. A member could come to Taladhaj and work on batik, various facilities for which were provided. Today, Karu Shongho is the only place, perhaps, where one can find original Shantiniketan batik. However, they take on traditional designs and very little experimentation can be seen today. A few dedicated septuagenarian and octogenarian ladies get together twice a week to discuss orders they have received and distribute the work amongst themselves. They use the designs of Gauri Bhonjo, Jomuna Shen, and Ila Ghosh, who were some of the founders of this institution. The batik works are done by these wonderful ladies who spent their lifetime creating beautiful batik pieces. The beautiful silk stones, stoles that are worn by university dignitaries at official events are their handicraft. Taladhoj lies on the main road running through Shantiniketan. It was inspirational watching these old ladies dyeing their cloth in huge vats and putting their colored cloths to dry on a clothesline. Unfortunately, this site is no longer visible. Some of them are now too old to come to Taladhaj, but they still contribute items for sale at a stall at the annual Mela. 
in general, except for Karu Shongo and Shilpo Shodon, and perhaps a few individuals, the quality of batik has deteriorated over the years. The Kalabhavan Fine Arts course does not include batik in its syllabus any longer. A short-term certificate course in crafts, however, includes batik. The local craftsmen cater to the small town market and there is no standard that is adhered to. Events like the one arranged by Sutra in 2011 may hopefully revive an interest in good quality batik because only a strong demand for quality products can actually help the de this decadent cottage industry to rejuvenate itself. Although the art of batik has stagnated in Shantiniketan, a few individual artists are doing good work. A lot of research on batik is also taking place. Recently, Amrita and I did a survey of the kind of batik that is being done in Shantiniketan. This is Karu Shongho. The shops that cater to tourists have two kinds of batik. One that looks like batik but are actually prints. The second type have batik but the designs are naturally not up to the mark. We visited a weekly bazaar that is available to small scale traders. All kinds of craft are sold here. Embroidery work, cotton quilts, straw mats and baskets, jewelry made from seeds, woodwork, etc. The bazaar is spread over a large area near a forest of Shonajuri and is a picturesque spot. Tourists flock to this bazaar on Saturdays and the traders usually do good business. It was over here that we found two batik stalls. The first had batik that is available to the wayside shops, the, uh, that are available in the wayside shops. The women who were selling her wares, that lady, said that there are a number of batik factories where they work. They are given cloth with a design drawn on it. She does the waxing at home. Then she hands it back where it is then dyed. She gets, uh, they get their designs from Kalabhavan students who provide these for pocket money. The designs are therefore amateurish. We were then in for a surprise. Two young men had spread, spread their wares on the ground. Silk saris with batik work. The designs were not typically Shantini Getun, but, but were quite attractive. On probing, we were told that a gentleman called Shubhashish Ghosh designed the saris and had trained two girls from the village to help him. They completed two saris a month, and these two young men who talked, who, whom we talked to sold these at the weekly market. Later, we found out from Kala Bhavan that this gentleman's father was Shishir Ghosh, a teacher at Kala Bhavan, and was very skilled in batik. Omrita found another lady, Kanun Bhattacharji, who eked out a living doing batik in her home. She is teaching her granddaughter the technique, and the young girl helps her grandmother. In this way, batik is still alive in Shantiniketan. But this industry could do with some support and proper guidance, especially in design. The government does offer incentives through self-help groups and financial loans, though not particularly for batik, but for crafts. But what these artisans really need is training, guidance, and an assured market. As with everything else, designs, trends, and color preferences change with time. Traditional designs taken from nature have been gradually replaced with geometric designs, unconventional motifs, often reflecting local tastes and culture. With the advance of science, the color palette has become wider, with acid colors adding a fluorescence not seen earlier. Experimentation with batik has also taken place. Instead of applying molten wax with the use of a brush, some artists use tiny blobs of wax on the surface, giving it a different pattern. 
the cloth is often tied before dyeing, giving it a tie and dye effect. One designer in Shantiniketan mixes and matches batik with quilt embroidery, creating exquisite items for her boutique. The scope and range is endless. Resist dye printing on textile had developed in many parts of the world, especially in Eurasia, Africa, and the Far East. In India, we have numerous resist dye techniques. There is the dabu printing of Rajasthan that uses mud, sawdust, and wheat chaff. Bandhni, the tie and dye technique whereby individual areas of the fabric is knotted. Ajrak resist printing from Kutch in Gujarat uses mud resist and has been practiced since medieval times. In the regions of Ladakh, Kashmir, and Tibet, there is the thigma, a tie resist dyeing on wool. Scholars believe that resist dye technique using wax traveled to Indonesia from the Coromandel coast. All the art schools and colleges in Mumbai, the fashion capital of India, have a small batik unit and students are taught batik. But practice of batik is limited to classwork. Embroidery and other kinds of textile embellishments are more in vogue in the city. This is the current situation. I spoke to a teacher of batik in Ahmedabad, Gujarat. She teaches a number of textile printing techniques in her art school. Batik is practiced, she said, but on a smaller scale. Students prefer shibori. When I asked her where the batik is available in Ahmedabad, she said certain large sari shops would perhaps keep some, but as she said, Gujarat is so rich in beautiful textiles that one does not look for batik here. In Ujjain, a master artisan, Muhammad Sharif, works with traditional batik techniques on Maheshwari silk cotton saris, which are quite popular and beautiful and are available in large sari shops. Batik is being done on a commercial scale in some cities. One can buy these saris at large sari shops and even online. Some boutiques also sell these. The focus of these clothes are on making them colorful and striking without giving too much effort on the design. A far cry from the intricate designs of Shantiniketan. We now come to the Kalabhavan collection of textiles which Rabindranath brought with him in 1927. There are 30 items of Java batik in this collection. The items were not accessioned immediately. This delay was because these textiles were used for stage decor and du uh, during dance performances. Since these textiles traveled with the dance troops, many of these have worn out and even damaged. After their accessioning in the early 30s, they have been in the museum. The Kalabhavan collection is in urgent need of proper identification and documentation. We had sent out images to some well-known Batik experts, but since the images were not adequate, we received confusing opinions. We sincerely hope we could avail of the expertise of Maria Friend to help Bishop Harati in this regard. And I, I would like to invite Maria to just say a few words of this, uh, about this collection. Thank you. Yeah, this one? OK. Um, thank you very much. Uh, um, well, I'll be very happy to comment on some of those batik pieces, although I know them only from those uh, photographs, and some of them I will see for the first time. To assess batik properly, usually one has to examine the proper fabric and see both sides, and sometimes we need a really very close look at the fabric. Uh, to decide what kind of method, what use, what kind of technique. But uh, I'm very happy to give some just uh, brief comments. No um, uh, brief comments. Uh, this uh, type of uh, fabric, which we see here, which could be used as a wall hanging or perhaps a table cover, was definitely made on Java, but for non-Javanese population. 
um, because Indonesians used batik only as uh, garments. They did not use uh, batik at that time in uh, interior decoration. But there was quite a large uh, community of uh, Dutch, for example, who liked to use uh, batik uh, for their house decoration and uh, special pieces were made just uh, for the Dutch. So I think that this uh, batik belongs to that group probably. Um, this is an interesting batik. It is associated with uh, Kraton et Miss Sultan Palace in Solo, perhaps. Um, what is interesting here, this uh, central design which uh, we see here, this uh, pattern here, diagonal pattern, is known as Parankrusak, broken dagger. It is one of the most popular uh, batik patterns and traditionally it was restricted to the use of uh, Javanese rulers. However, what is a little bit uh, confusing here um, are those flowers at the bottom and the top because uh, usually this kind of decoration would not be worn at a palace. So I'm not sure, perhaps, but the colors are also typical for Central Java. This is so-called Kainsogan, this dyed in indigo and the brown color, which was Katashu related to Gambil. Um, so perhaps it was worn somewhere on Java um, in a style of a palace, I would say, but worn by commoners, perhaps people who were non-aristocrats. Um, this is um, a fabric, uh, we just see a central part of this cloth. It was uh, worn by women on Java as kemben, it means a breast cover, it was wrapped around torso and uh, sometimes it was decorated with this kind of a lozenge with uh, open uh, center, sometimes the central part would be um, decorated with very fine silk, it varied. Uh, it could be associated with uh, a palace, but uh, perhaps it was worn by somebody else, but it's typical for Central Java. This batik is a bit unusual. As it says in the opinion, it is rather strange, or I would say unusual piece of batik, because once again, uh, this is a sarong, I'm sorry, uh, this is a sarong, and uh, therefore, this main part of this cloth, it is known here as uh, badan, body, and it is decorated with this diagonal design, this very important Parangrusak design. However, here we see uh, elements, motifs, which would be associated with Islam, with Islamic faith. And uh, who knows, um, on Java, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were more than 100 Batik workshops which were run by Arab community, uh, so-called Peranakan Arab. And I found that they developed their own distinctive style of batik and quite frequently this kind of motifs would be associated with uh, Arab batiks of Java. So perhaps it originates from there. Oh, this is uh, a typical central Javanese uh, uh, batik. Uh, we have here the uh, very popular in Indonesia motif of uh, the wing of Garuda known as Lar, you'll find this motif also, it was very popular on Kashmiri shawls. It definitely came with trade textiles from India to Indonesia, but in Indonesia it took different names, different meanings. So here this is the wing of this mythical ger bird uh, Garuda. We know it as Buddha on <laughs> textiles made in India. And the colors are typical for Central Java, and you can see this very dense background, which is also uh, a favorite feature of Javanese aesthetics. This is a close-up of, close of that yes, pardon? This is the color. This is the color, yes, this is the proper color. So we see this is the Kain Sogan. I, uh, it's worth to remember the name Kain Sogan. It's blue and brown combination, typical for Central Java. Um, because I will be referring to it in my presentation soon as well. <laughs> and uh, this batik is uh, certainly associated with the uh, northern coast of Java. Uh, the fabrics which were made there were more, much more colorful, they were a bit more similar to 
uh, batik sarongs which were worn in Malaysia or produced in Malaysia here on the eastern coast. And this pattern, indeed, it is a Javanese rendition of uh, the famous double ikat uh, patola, which used to be imported in large numbers from India to Indonesia. Uh, this is also batik from uh, northern coast of uh, Java, and uh, this kind of scenes with birds or rockeries, uh, sometimes they could be associated with a tree of life design, which would be very deeply transformed here. Uh, sometimes uh, those motifs are very close to the tree of life design. Here they, they are rather removed, and we have other birds, uh, added to it. This kind of batiks used to be made in workshops which were run um, on Java by women from mixed marriages, uh, uh, Dutch and uh, Javanese. Uh, sometimes also uh, such motifs would be used in Chinese workshops. And this is once again a decorative fabric from central Java um, once again, it was probably made for the Dutch uh, community living on Java because uh, on uh, um, Javanese batiks worn by Javanese people or Sundanese people on Java, usually you don't find those, uh, this kind of shadow theater figures. Sometimes you find them, but those are very small motifs and they are very well integrated to the main design. They never stand out on their own like this. So this would be for outside market. This is once again a typical batik from Surakarta um, that would be associated with Kraton, with uh, the house of the rulers. Uh, typical for Surakarta is that yellowish background. In Jogjakarta you will find white background, but Surakarta is yellowish. Extremely fine design. Once again, we see here Sorry. We see here the um, wing of uh, Garuda and also here double wings. This is the palmet motif, which was also very popular in India and moved to Batik. Once again, Kainsogan. This is uh, once again um, a Batik that might have originated from the same workshop or from the same place. Once again, br uh, brown, yellow, and uh, very dark indigo. And um, this motif is truntum, yes. And it is usually worn by the parents of a bride during wedding ceremony. Um, Will be close up. This is the close up, yes. Those are tiny flowers which sometimes are interpreted as stars in the sky. And um, this is typical central Javanese uh, pattern associated with weddings. Um, this is uh, once again this uh, very famous uh, uh, Parank Rusak uh, motif, diagonal motif, that tradition was restricted to the use of a ruler and his uh, family. Uh, smaller versions of this motif would be worn by women, larger ones uh, by men. Definitely Central Java. And um, this is once. Um, again, the scarf, which was worn as uh, either breast cover or it could be as a scarf slendang, but I think it would be rather breast cover here. And this is a combination of two techniques here. The yellow field is uh, batik, but here between the mauve and the yellow, those white signs, this is uh, um, uh, the technique which is known as tritic, this is stitch dyeing. Well, similar type of uh, batik as regards its function, but the pattern is um, um, very small, diagonal, very fine. It was also associated with people of a high uh, standing in Javanese uh, society. So in Java, traditionally, by looking at a pattern, who were, what, you could read what was the social position of that person if you knew the language. Nowadays, it is disappearing. This is once again Kain Sogan, this blue and uh, 
indigodite uh, batik and uh, uh, probably associated with uh, the court uh, representation of Javanese uh, universe which has strong roots in Hinduism, uh, medieval Hinduism of Java. That's um, another close-up with this uh, palmetto motif which uh, Indonesians, this palmetto motif, very ancient Asian motif, once again in Indonesia it is uh, interpreted as the bird Garuda and similar batik, uh, also probably from Surakarta, used as a breast cover for women. This, however, uh, has a whitish background, not so yellow, so I presume that this is from the other court which was visited by Rabindranath Tagore at uh, Yogyakarta. But once again, royal motifs. And this is a very beautiful um, headscarf, um, Ikat Kepala, once again with diagonal motifs. This is a silk fabric. Uh, production of batik on silk was initiated in Chinese workshops at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, as uh, uh, the French who accompanied Tagore um, also purchased uh, fabrics in Chinese workshops on Java, it's well possible that this batik would originate from one of those uh, Chinese workshops. Uh, the motifs are typical for, for Java and uh, Oh, sorry. Here we have uh, imitation of fringes drawn in wax. It's a headscarf once again with this uh, very special diagonal motif which was favored on Java. Mm, this is uh, drawstring back, okay with uh, the motif of Garuda. Well, I think it was made once again for Europeans uh, who lived on Java. I don't think Javanese would wear it, although it's, the colors are typical. This is um, another bag, as I see, with a cord strap. Hmm, looks like maybe made from an old fabric, recycled. I don't know, I'll have to see it all. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to say, but uh, the motif is typically Javanese. Those colors, once again, are typical for Surakarta or Solo with this uh, very, very warm uh, yellowish-brown uh, hue. So there were quite a few bags that were brought in that collection, which is unusual because uh, the Javanese would not wear used bags. So, uh, okay, that's the end of this uh, slide. Thank you.